McDermott, your masked pastor, wearing and sporting the new 1111 face mask, and proudly wearing it in support and protection of our of our neighbors, one another. So um, we'd love to send you one of these new face masks, also uh, created by Brian Jolin and his uh, promotional uh, organization, who also gave us this, the Sip, Breathe, Smile 1111 Tumblr. Love to send you one of these, especially if you're visiting with us for the first time. We'd love to send one your way. Just give us your information there. And the registration form on the, on the spaces on the side, you can uh, let us know that you want one of these. And we're so glad that you have joined in with us this morning. Also glad to see the rest of you here this morning. Glad you can see me this morning. <laughs> glad you're with us. Hope you're doing well. And um, coming up on Monday, this Monday and next Monday, the 24th and the 31st, we have special crafting Difficult Conversations, which is usually hosted by uh, myself and by Daryl Parker. But we are going to be joined with uh, by Estrus Tucker, master facilitator, a, a great individual who's done a lot of restorative practices and reconciliation work with race relations in this area, but throughout the country and beyond for the last couple of several decades. He lives in this general area, and we're just lucky to catch him when he's in the area. He's going to be offering us a free workshop for two Monday evenings at 7 p.m. for about an hour or so. We'll have some small breakout groups during that time. And the Zoom link is at our church website, fumcfw.org. Just scroll down, see the image that you saw up here. Click it and join in with the Zoom tomorrow at 7 p.m. It's going to be great and hope you can join us for that. Listen, coming up, Elizabeth Wills, one of our favorite good friends, Fort Worth area singer-songwriter 
is going to be offering a, a new song and a video that she's done. We can't wait for that. Um, then coming at the end, Lisa Stovall, who's also been with us in the past. She's joining us with Brad Thompson and the band for a special song. So it's a good morning, and uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of generous listening as a virtue to bring hope and interest into these times that sometimes seem otherwise. Um, Brian Jolin, speaking of, is going to start us with our welcome candle. Sharon will, will give us a prayer. Look forward to seeing you uh, soon. Glad you're with us. Come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times. Come yet again. Good morning, everybody. Well, we've made it this far on our journey, and here we are together again. We're like hikers on a trail. We're stopping for just a moment to pay attention to the place where we are now standing. The sky is still above us, the ground is still below us, and all around us are the trappings of our personal and family lives, and the constant slip and slope of the hardened trail where all humanity walks. We give thanks for the awe and wonder that is never far away, of course, the beauty of the earth, but also the gifts of technology, the lessons of history, and the music that enlivens us. And not least of all, the kindness of people whose arms reach out for us when we stumble. We're thankful also for the people who've cleared paths that we might not have chosen. And it's exciting to think that we too might be able to set up trail markers for people who are still to come. And so we give thanks in all things, even the hard things, because all around us, the side trails, the smooth paths, the new growth that appears in a decaying and fallen tree, all of these things remind us that we are part of a holy mystery and that the beginnings and the endings of our lives are not completely within our understanding. But somehow, the music of the universe helps us give thanks. And so we say, Christ above us, Christ beside us, Christ within us, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. He stepped out into the ocean. The storm chased him all the way home. Piece of centrifugal motion, and he found himself stranded alone. He didn't know. Voices are always behind her 
His mama went out three days ago And he finds himself stranded alone He shouldn't know Good to be with you this morning, and good to have you with us. Um, it's uh, with it's uh, the, we're in the fifth week of our series. I'm looking at the fifth virtue of what could bring hope and interest to life in times that seem otherwise. Uh, we talk about the six virtues to bring hope and life and interest to times that seem otherwise. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about listening today. In particular, we're going to talk about generous listening. But when I'm thinking of generosity, I want to first thank Elizabeth Wills because. Uh, that was that was such a gift to us to have that song. We, I'm so so glad that you would share that with us. Um, and then also Charm Your Prayer. Thank you so much for that as well. Um, afterward, Lisa Stovall will be with Brad Thompson, and Lisa and the band are going to do a great song to kind of wrap up this whole thing. So stick around for that. But we're talking about listening today. The virtue of generous listening. What do we mean when we talk about listening? Who listened you? into wholeness? Who listens you into wholeness? Who do you go to that you truly feel caressed in the way that they listen to you? That you even find yourself discovering more about yourself through that listening? And who have you been, who's, who have you done that for, right? So what is this act of generous listening? Tell a couple of quick jokes. Grandmother, she, a grandmother's out by the ocean and she's uh, on the beach and her grandson is up close to the water when suddenly a big wave catches him and carries him out into the ocean. Well, she panics and she's screaming and then she cries to the heavens, Oh God, oh God, save my grandson! And suddenly a wave kicks the grandson back up onto the beach. The boy stands up and shakes. He's, he's soggy, but, soggy, but he's fine. But then she looks at his head and she looks up the heavens and said, He had a hat? A father is standing at the door of his house, front door. His son, six years old, is standing behind him on the steps. He's talking to one of his neighbors and tells him a joke. He says, hey, Mac, a three-legged dog walks into a bar, goes up to the bartender and says, I've come for the guy who shot my paw. The two men are laughing. The boy's laughing. The next day, the father overhears his son with one of the other neighborhood kids in the front yard, and his son says, hey, Billy, this three-legged dog walks into a bar and says, I've come for the guy who shot my dad. And they both start laughing. They don't get the joke, but it's hilarious. Listening often has a couple of things that get in the way. And as we start, start thinking about this, I want you to think about the, uh, what, what gets in the way of clearly hearing something. What gets in the way of clearly experiencing the moment that we're in? Is it the preconceived outcome? Is it the expected outcome? Is it this idea that there's something within us that's never quite satisfied and so we can't quite be satisfied in the moments we find ourselves or with the gratitude and the graciousness of a moment that we experience? Is it because we come into moments thinking we know what we know when in fact how can we possibly not what we not know what we don't know and yet we assume we have biases that when we come into our moments we come in either defensive or we come in either expecting a certain response and hearing that response in spite of what might have been said so so we have these expected outcomes that oftentimes 
hinder us from experiencing the moment. We have these, these cognitive biases, this sense of knowing and certainty and familiarity that in fact masks what we don't know and what we're not hearing. Listening somehow has to move through that. So let's talk about the story of Martha and Mary real quick. And we'll run through about 15 minutes here of, of some ideas I want to share with you of what might we, we might think of as generous listening. Um, this is, comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it's uh, chapter 10. As Jesus traveled, he entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him to her home. And she had a sister named Mary. Mary went and sat herself at the feet of at Jesus' feet and listened to his words. Martha, who was busy with all the details of hospitality, came over to Jesus and she said, Rabbi, don't you see that I'm doing all of this work? Tell my sister Mary to come and help me. But Jesus looked at her and said, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and upset about so many things. Only a few things are necessary, really only one. And, Mar and Mary has chosen the better part so she won't be deprived of it. What an interesting story, and one in which we, we've heard, and a lot of us are familiar with this story, and we sort of assume these sort of uh, traditional roles, these traditional ways in which we understand Martha and Mary and the jealousy and, and the impatience, one's working and the other's doing another thing, but something else is going on here. Um, Jesus has been talking to these disciples and telling them stories, and all of the stories always speak of the one thing that's important, the kingdom of God in their midst. What is, what is the ruling sort of value that undergirds the kingdom of God, but the love of God and neighbor as self, right? This compassionate engagement with equity, inclusiveness, justice, um, and it's all grounded in this humble walk with the very ground of our being. What is the one thing Mary is paying attention to? Martha is so anxious about so many things. The other thing is that the, the, what Martha is doing really is not domestic work. Um, in fact, most scholars believe that this word diakona, which is the word for what she's doing, is really for deacon. It really means servant. She's playing a servant role in being a part of probably what was the early community of followers of Jesus, because Luke was written around 70 AD, maybe 80 AD, so written sometime after Jesus' death. What was her role? But she was participating in sort of one of the roles of ministry of service. And yet Mar Mary was more in the role of disciple because she was sitting at the feet of a rabbi, which was to be one who was studying and one who was learning. So Mar Mary was in this engaged place of being present. But this is the idea I want you to think about. This idea of what is the one thing? What is the one thing before us? And what does listening have to do with that one thing? So we think about the word listen. If you look at its roots, listen means attend to, right? It means paying attention to. We know that. But there's something else here that I found that was interesting. If you start looking at the shared root words of attending, attending is to sort of take apart and hear. It's sort of to see and perceive more deeply. But it pulls out something. And if you, if you play with the words and you look at the word fame or fabular, Fabular is a, is a root word for fable, or it means to tell. The actual word fame, the actual root word for fame, means to speak, to be heard. So it shares this idea of listening. To be listened to is fame. Not, now, we've taken it to mean like everybody's, you know, you're famous because everybody's heard of you, right? Like I remember when I, was, when I was doing storytelling and traveling around the country and going to schools, elementary schools and such, as a children's author, I, the first few schools I was going to, I had to get used to this kind of thing. And, and I saw probably twenty or 30,000 kids, but this would always come up. And I was at a school where a third grade class, I was telling stories to this third grade class, the teachers introduced me and I stepped out. And immediately before I could talk, these two third graders were on the front row. And this one guy looked at the other guy and said, hey, is this guy famous? And the guy looked back and said, I never heard of him. And that was it. I was almost dismissed. I mean, whatever I did next better catch their attention, right? So it, it, fame is this idea that we have that it means you're known by a lot of people. It means that your name is recognized. It means that you make a lot of money or that you have a lot of attention paid to you. But that's not really the root meaning of fame is really to be known authentically. It is to know authentically something. That's what fame means. It means to be told about, to tell the story of. And so, so listening has this, this idea that it, paying attention is drawing out one's fame. Hmm? 
That's an, that's, that's where I want you to hang on to this idea. Paying attention or listening is paying attention in a way that draws out one's essence, one's authentic self. How do we listen to one another in a way that does that? Who listens to you in a way that you feel yourself so deeply, truly heard that you feel as if you are rooted in something deep and significant? And, and who do you listen to that offers that same thing? So, you know, we have these echo chambers, right? We, we surround ourselves in this, in this time and culture where we're in social media and such, and especially in this device of time, and especially with COVID, how much time we're spending, that it's often pretty typical that we surround ourselves with like-minded people. And that we text and we, we Twitter and we, and we uh, kind of surround ourselves in social media with people who think like us and we resonate with our same anxiousness and our same anger and our same frustration. It's interesting. Do you know the story Echo and Narcissus? Lynn's an interesting idea on this, um, or perspective on this. Echo is a nymph who Hera has condemned to the forest because a bunch of nymphs were flirting with Zeus, her husband, and so she condemns them to this forest and bans them to this forest they can't leave. Well, this one nymph, Echo, is, um, is cursed to where she can only repeat what she hears because she talks so much and she kind of was sassy with Hera. So Hera said, you'll only be able to repeat what you hear. Well, here comes Narcissus, a young, handsome, I mean, beautifully handsome uh, young man who stumbles upon this pool of water and sees his reflection and is so caught by what he sees. He's so enamored with the image of what he sees that he reaches, he, he calls out to what the image is. He says, you're beautiful, and he hears the echo, you're beautiful, you're so handsome, and he hears the echo, you're handsome. I long to belong with you, and he hears, I long to belong with you, and so this echo continues to reinforce his own self-absorption, his own self-focus, until what happens is that echo remains an echo of whatever is shouted. And Narcissus remained a plant. He literally became planted beside the water so that only his reflection is seen and experienced. In other words, when we surround ourselves with echo chambers, aren't we really simply limiting our expansiveness? Are we limiting the possibility of what we might become because we don't venture into the less familiar or cross over to the uncomfortable? Listening to someone, even to someone with whom we disagree, or someone that has cons that someone with whom we're angry, listening to one another is an, is, as far as a virtue, is this opportunity to bring out the essence of one's truest self. What we would say is their imago dei, their 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 rootedness in God, right? They're, that we all belong, that we all are a part of this bigger picture of shalom. How do we do that? Well, listening is one of the virtues that allows us to bring one another more interestingly into life. Uh, there's a great story of Elijah the prophet in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, right? Um, I think it's the 19th chapter. And, and Ahab comes up to him, the king Ahab, has um, basically is killing the, has killed the Jews and the Israelites and the prophets. He's killed all the prophets. And Elijah is one of the last prophets. And he comes up to Elijah. He actually comes up to him and says, listen, you're next. You're on the list. What I've done to them, I'm going to do to you. And the next day, Elijah, or that night, Elijah heads out into the country. He heads out of there as fast as he can. And he's gone off into the, you know, into the mountains. He, and, he, and as he's traveling and running, he listens for the voice of God. But he, he hears a voice of God that says, you got to eat if you're going to keep going. And so he just keeps running. And, and he runs for 40 days. And finally, he hears a voice that says, you're going to have to run into the mountains. And so he runs into the mountains and he heads into a cave. And in the dark cave, he hears a voice that says, you can't stay here. You have to go to the high mountain, go to the highest mountain and stand there and listen for the voice of God to tell you what to do. And so he runs to the top of the mountain and it's a long, exhaustive journey, right? And he gets there and then there's this storm cloud that comes through and the rumbling thunder just shakes the ground and the foundations beneath him. And then this lightning flashing all around him. And then this flame, this great fire flashes about him. And then after all of that, still not the voice of God until everything has passed. And there is this tiny, still whisper of a voice, the still small voice. And the voice says, Elijah, where are you? What's Mary listening to 
What's the one thing that Jesus is saying she's paying, that she's doing the right thing? What is that still small voice when we finally can kind of crack through all of the outer shells and all of the, all of the masks and all of the sort of preconce the sort of cognitive biases, when we can finally listen long enough to hear the still small voice, that's the challenge. Um, you know, people think of mindfulness as being this sort of quiet and just being still and, and sort of being relaxed. But really mindfulness is focusing on something so intentionally that you see something larger that's there. That's still a small voice. Um, John Cage, the mid-20th the mid century composer, he came out, um, he, he created a piece in 1950 called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. You've probably heard of this. Um, it, it was taken as sort of a joke at first, but it really became quite a profound thing and people began to play off of it and work and experiment with it more. But he was an experimental composer and he went to the Philharmonic, uh, uh, the uh, New York Symphony uh, Hall and and everyone came to hear him because he was a well-known composer. Nobody knew what to expect, but he had this one piece that was being premiered. And so the pianist comes out to the chair, to the chair and the piano pulls back the, the, um, the, the, the stand for the music. And I think the music's going to be thrown up here. You'll see it's just a blank sheet, it's just a blank score, but it's still marked for time signatures. And he places it there in the, in the music stand on the piano. And then he sits back, flips his tail back behind him and sits there in his tux, staring at the blank pages. And after about a minute, it's getting awkward because it's silent, except it's not silent, right? Because you're hearing breathing, you're hearing one another's wrestling, rustling around, you're hearing the discomfort, a little bit of moan, a grumbling, maybe even a little whispering going on. And a minute and a half into it, and you're noticing, oh, there's, there's, this, there's engine noise coming maybe from the cars on the street or maybe from the air conditioning units in the building, and you're hearing maybe something drop on the floor, and all of a sudden there's this a variety of different sounds, but it's becoming overwhelmed with frustration. You hear people murmuring and ang getting angry, and some are one by one getting up until whole groups of people are getting up and walking out, so you're hearing the rustling of the feet. And after about four minutes or so, the, 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 uh, the auditorium is down to about a, th a fourth of the size, it says. And uh, when it was over, he stood up and he bowed, and there was applause, kind of a smattering of applause. This was a world premiere piece. Later on, when he talked to someone about it, because they said, what was this all about? Was this some, some, some kind of joke, a prank? And he said, no. He said, we are so preoccup preoccupied with sound, with what sound should be, that we miss the sound that is. We get so preoccupied with the sounds that we think should be, that we miss the sounds that already are, that we are right in the midst of. And sometimes the way to hear the still small voice means we have to be attentive enough to draw out the authentic self, the authentic moment, the authentic meaning of where we are, what we're dealing with. And that, that tr that's true being with someone who's suffering, right? You know, the interesting thing about the word understanding or perceive, perceive means to understand. We, um, Hannah Arendt had this wonderful definition of the word percept or this idea. She was the poet and philosopher of the early 20th century. And she said, we don't perceive a thing as it is, right? You remember? She says, we perceive a thing as we are. I mean, we don't hear still small voice of something. We don't see the essence of something. We don't see or experience the fame of the moment because we are too preoccupied or too already um, biased with what we know it is. Listening is unpacking. Listening is that intentional attending to something that wants to get deeper into it. If it means taking ourselves apart in the process, right? Taking our own assumptions, just sitting with. And that's the challenge, right? When we come into moments, we find ourselves how difficult it is to actually listen. I mean, as a guy, a mansplaining, I think I probably find that I do that several times a week. My apologies to everyone that I live with or that I talk to or that I work with. Um, I, I mess up. I am so bad sometimes at this whole idea. But that's what preachers do. We preach about some of our worst failings, right? So some of the great learning curves that we have ahead of us. Um, so I'm going to play this for you. You know what this is. It's a little short one-minute clip, but watch this. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And 
I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't. I mean, you you know this, and and isn't this true, right? We. We, we can't sit and listen. Especially, I think maybe this is true for men, but, but not just for men. Women do this too. We feel the need to sort of explain, to fix what the moment is because we have this preconceived idea that there's, there's an outcome, an expected outcome. Things should be fixed. When in reality, sometimes what is fixing is simply being present enough for, the, for what is authentic to surface, for what is fame, what is famous to surface, if you will to be authentic to itself. Um, the the um, idea that, that what we're trying to do when we listen to someone is to perceive. If you look at the root word for perceive, another playing with words here real quick as we get towards the end, is the idea of perceiving is to understand. But look up the word, the etymology, etymology of understanding, and it's weird, it means to stand in, to stand inside. It's like empathy. Right? Empathy is not feeling for someone, it's feeling with someone. That's, empathy is this shared experience, it's trying to be present enough to the experience that we literally stand in the midst of that experience. Uh, understanding with another and listening and for understanding, uh, that's something that, that, um, that of course, uh, Estrus Tucker is going to be talking about on Monday night for the next two Mondays. hope some of y'all can join us for this great workshop he's going to offer, listening for understanding. I mean, understanding is this standing in the midst of. It doesn't mean we get it, but it means we're with it. We are present to it. And that's the challenge of listening, of attending to, in order to let the the, the authenticity of it, the, the, the moment, what is right there in front of us, reveal itself. There's a great story from the, from the poet, um, the, uh, the, the poet Jack Riddle. When he was a boy, he tells this story. He said he was out in, the, in the, a grassy field, and his mom had called out to him and said, it's time for us to go, so come on in. And he says, I can't, I can't. And she said, why? And he was so desperate. He was, he was just looking around and looking down at the grass, and he said, because there are still blades of grass to which I haven't paid attention to. There's, that's what Mary was doing. That's the one thing that Jesus was saying about me. There's so many things to be worried about. But where are you at this moment? I mean, it's, it's like the old Zen idea, right? It's where we are in this moment. We're not, we're not letting go and being mindless. Or mindlessly overwhelmed, but we are mindfully engaged in this one moment, so completely present to what is before us that some other depth will always open a way that clears a path forward. Whether it's a moment of insight or a breath of calm that we're experiencing in our own pain or an unexpected delight that we hadn't expected to experience, but it's suddenly something someone else shared in their story reminds us of our story and we remember something we'd forgotten long ago and all of a sudden our universe our lives our world has been enlarged because we listened that's what the experience gets to be when we pay attention to the one thing where we are in the moment um i know when i started getting involved with uh, storytelling groups there was this sort of secondary, this sort of 
ancillary organization of groups that sort of formed around shared story. They were a lot like 12-step programs. In fact, the things that arose out that came out of those 12-step programs became more sort of like spiritual 12-step programs. Um, but here's the thing that, com that binds all of these programs that seems to ground them in a healing path, or that what we might call, uh, as people of faith, the path of shalom, of wholeness, of completeness. And what that was was the shared story. But what it took was the presence of someone who invited that story out, who invited to that other person to talk. Without judgment, without preconception, but with this willingness, this eagerness to know more, this curiosity. What would we say the root word for curiosity was? Cura, to care, to take in hand. So, so this idea of listening is all about standing inside with another curiously investigating, going deeper into that center to begin to reveal the authentic of the moment, what's there, the delight that always comes from staring at another blade of grass. Suddenly the delight that you didn't expect because you simply attended to it more deeply. So let's see, get a couple of quick takeaways that I might share with you as we move on and uh, get ready for Lisa to sing. First of all, listening is a spiritual virtue as a practice to place us in the path of shalom. It's the practice of leaning into others generously, curiously. Secondly, listening is the practice of being with the moment, the one thing, perceiving the moment, the one we're with, the feeling we're experiencing the doubt that we're having until we acknowledge that we don't get it and yet we stay with it. And finally, the goal of this listening is a deeper understanding, not necessarily for answers or certainty. Certainty is overrated, as Brian McLaren would say. But to reach that place of standing in the midst of the moment of the space between us, standing in the midst with another. That's what listening is. So I hope this week you have a chance to do some of that. And I hope this week you experience some blessings as well. Maybe I hope, and more than anything, that you experience that moment of being listened to so deeply that you discover something of yourself as well. Um, stick around for the song. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Well, the rain, it keeps on coming down. Feels like a flood in my head And that road, it keeps on calling me Screaming to everything, lying ahead And it's a winding road I've been walking for a long time I still don't know where it goes And it's a long way home I've been searching for a long time but I still have hope I'm gonna find my way home and I can see a little house on top
Thank you.